look at that scenery. There aren't many things that leave me damn near speechless, but this does. I'm in the center of the Scottish Highlands, which is about as remote as one can get in the British Isles, and pretty remote in a European context too. But however remote I may be geographically, when it comes to the argument that's raging in agriculture today, this is where it's all about. We're at the center of the argument, because here in the Highlands is where all the controversy is today. Controversy is too polite a word. The upland farmers of Britain, from Cornwall to the Highlands here, are desperate and angry, and they think nobody cares. I've come to see how John Cameron, one of the canniest farmers in Scotland, is coping in Perthshire. He's really a hill farming tycoon who also owns arable farms in Fife. in these conditions is about as tough as it gets. But he's obviously got faith in the future of the hills because he's just bought himself a second glen. When I was told I was going to come and talk to John Cameron, I was also told that I was going to talk to the biggest sheep farmer in Europe. Is this true? Aye, well, you also told that you were going to speak to the sheep farmer with the biggest overdraft in Europe. Well, let's do the overdraft second and we'll do the sheep farming first. Is uh, it true? I've no idea and, and I really am not caring very much. I, I try to look after the sheep that I've got. That's the main thing. Well, you clearly do that. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> there are 10,000 sheep on these two glens. That works out at one animal on every five acres. So in this bit of Scotland alone, you're farming 50,000 acres. That sounds an awful lot to me. I'm poor little smallholder from East Anglia. Oh, dear. I'd swap you any day. Uh, done. 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 Absolutely. Uh, yours right. prettier than mine. Ah, prettier. Big. But you can't live on, on, you can't live on beauty. But, but no, the, the, the point is, it's, it's, it's a question of trying to uh, use the natural resource up here to, to the best of its ability. Now, you know, we can't grow tatties up here, we can't grow cereals, uh, we can't milk cows, so what we do, we can, keep, we can keep sheep and perhaps a limited number of cows, although there's no cows in this place. Your shepherd's having a job getting these sheep through the gate. Do you think our presence is frightening them a bit? I would say your presence could be frightening them a bit. Well, I don't blame them. I'm frightened of them and they should be frightened of me. John Cameron and I both receive subsidies from Brussels. I get around £100 an acre, he gets around £20 per sheep. It's interesting, though, because your subsidy check, if, if that's the case, must be around about 200,000 quid, which is about what mine is. And we both employ the same number of men. And yet, in every other respect, our farms are on different planets. I mean, let's be quite clear about, about you know, the purpose of this subsidy. And perhaps an industry, we haven't done enough about defending ourselves. But, I mean, let me try and put it this way to simpl simplify things. If there was no subsidy, there'd be no sheep in these hills. Absolutely not. Not a sheep if there was no subsidy. It just would not be viable, not be economically viable. Why? Explain to me well, why. Well, the sheer economics of it. I mean, we need, we need that income from the subsidy to, make, to allow us to run a viable business. Now, if there was no sheep on these hills, there'd be no men on these hills. Your situation down in some of the best land in the country is totally different from mine. If your subsidies withdrew tomorrow, you wouldn't fold up. So subsidies. Oh, I would. I well, would. You, you, you might fall up, but 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 you know someone else would come in. You know if you can't grow some other crop on your ground, someone else would. But but the important point is that the social fabric in your part of the world wouldn't fold up. Whereas up here, with great respect, if we tend, if we differ on this, we have to differ on it. But up here, it would. And that's the big difference. There must be many people who say, if John Cameron, with 50,000 acres and 10,000 sheep, needs a ruddy great subsidy check, then there's something wrong with the world. But a little chap, a crofter on the island of Harris, that's another story. I agree. But it, it, it's a question of scale. I mean, the cost of keeping, the cost of keeping, if you like, a thousand ewes per ewe is as much as the cost of keeping 50 ewes per ewe. No, it shouldn't be. There's an economy of scale. Otherwise, you, there'd be no advantage. Well, I mean, in, 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 you know, again, that may be so in your part of the world. But, but I mean, up here, as I've tried to say to you, this is not, this is not a big setup. This is a sort of typical uh, setup uh, as far as the, the, the scale in, in this part of the world is concerned. Mm, John, come on, up here, this is a huge setup. You're the biggest bloody setup in the country, but, and you but, should be congratulated but, for but it. But the, the, the point is that in terms of subsidy income, size, size, you know, is, is not a criteria that makes any difference. 
as I say, if, 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 I lost, or if I lost the subsidy per U, then the effect on me would be the same as the fellow who had 50 U's and lost the subsidy. I do believe there is a future for us, but there isn't a future if we stand and sit in our backsides and do nothing. I've already explained our dependent subsidies. That doesn't mean that we sit back and do nothing. We utilise that income to try and develop our businesses so that we can face the future as well as you can face the future down in Essex. Cambridge. But never mind. Doesn't matter. So, John Cameron claims that size doesn't matter. To quote Mandy Rice Davis, he would say that, wouldn't he? <laughs> Three hundred and fifty miles south, hill farming's on a very different scale. This is one of the loveliest parts of Wales, the Horseshoe Pass, one thousand three hundred and sixty-seven feet above sea level. But I'm not here just to look at the scenery, lovely though it is. I'm here to talk to some small farmers who are in serious difficulties. Small may be beautiful in the eyes of most people, and with scenery like this, it certainly is. But as Rhys Hughes, the chap I'm going to go and see, I'm sure will tell me, beauty just doesn't pay the bills. Reese and his wife, Sean, live in the last farm up the valley. They've got 120 acres, 400 sheep, and a handful of cows. Oh, you are the boat. You're Reese. I'm Reese. Park up. Come and have a cup of tea with us. Can I? Yeah, park right. up there. Done. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at you two sitting out here in your nice outdoor chairs with the kids and the baby in bed, it gives me the impression, having been here only two minutes, that life is easy. But how close to the breadline are you? We're pretty close, aren't we, Sean? Yes. We, about 18 min months ago, we thought about um, applying for family credit. But we, we didn't. But I think when the... Um, Accounts come through in the forthcoming year. I think we'll probably will apply for family cre credit. And that's and just I, to I pay for the basics. That's to pay for the basics. No, we're not going on holiday anyway. That's to live. How much is your housekeeping? How farming has gone. Sean, I mean, how much do you get for housekeeping every month, week, whatever it is? Well, most of my wage actually go when I only work two days a week. Most of my wage goes on the the housekeeping yeah. and the childcare. Isn't it? Yeah. Sean works as a health, um, school, nurse. school nurse two days a week. It may have to happen that I'll have to go out to work. But we won't go from here. No, we're not going, we're not going from, from here. No. If, we, if we can earn our living here, we're not here to make a million. Just to pay the bills, Oliver, pay the bills. But we want to keep these valleys the same. But do you think you as a farmer and a farmer's wife and a farmer's family are somehow different than a coal miner or a shipbuilder? Or a steel worker. What makes you different, assuming there is a difference? Because of the countryside. Because it's other things, that, you know, it's what other people enjoy. I mean, I could go in there now and I can bring you out a poster from the Wales tour. Uh, shall I go and get it? Yeah, shall yeah I go, go and get, get it. Go and get, get it. it. Right. You know, we're being used, the, the farm, the valleys around here, are, is being, are being used to promote tourism in a, in a huge way. And Wales, you know, Thousands, of, pe that thousands of people. There we are. Now, that, that is a British tourist poster. British landscapes, and that's our farming. And that's what people want to see. That's why thousands and thousands and thousands of people come to Wales to enjoy Wales. And this is what they want to see, all of us. But do you know something? It's very interesting listening to you talk like this, because I've never really heard farmers talking like this. But the last two or three minutes, you've been talking almost like a guardian of a national park rather than as a producer of l lamb, mutton, well, beef. You're, you're really talking more about tourism than you are about... No, we've got to do both. We've got to do both. The, the, the countryside looks the way it is because animals graze on it. Who's going to, if the animals aren't there, is somebody going to come with a big lawn mower every couple of weeks to, you know, keep things down? The animals have got to be there and there's got to be somebody like Rears to look after them. But, you know, the thought occurs to me, talking to you two people, and you're very similar to most of the other farms I've talked with. You both love being farmers, you love being here, and as you, and as you rightly say, you're not going to quit unless you get carried out of a wooden box. Absolutely. But then the consequence of that point of view surely is why on God's name should any government 
pay you money when you love it anyway, when you're not going to be moved, when you're going to tighten your belt until you strangle well, hold yourself. Hold on a minute, Oliver, there is a limit, isn't there? Well, you know? I'm trying to find yeah, out I can't, where I can, is I that I can't limit. be on this picture here and, and, and be starving to death in the house, can I? I'm trying to find out where that limit is. But yeah, I'm well, sure there, there is, is a limit. limit. Where is that limit? There is a limit. Well, we're getting pretty close to that limit, to yeah. be honest, aren't we, Sean? Yeah. And a lot of other farmers are getting very close to that limit. You know, it's no good having glossy pictures in magazines and the farmer in the house starving, is it? No. Reese earned less than £7,000 last year, and since I saw him, prices have fallen even further. So however you look at it, there's really no way he's going to be able to make a decent income from the farm alone. In the harsh and cold marketplace, he's being squeezed out of existence. 70% of all meat today is sold in supermarkets where the customers, however much they may sympathise, just want cheap food. So if you turned up in a shopping centre in Liverpool and said to the housewives you found there, buy my sheep from a beautiful Welsh valley from a lovely farm, but it's going to cost you more, or buy New Zealand sheep and it's going to cost you less, do you think the housewife would really say, we will support old Rhys and his beautiful valley? Let's, find, let's ask first, how much more is the housewife going to be asked to pay? And, to, and for that, you've got to get Mr. Supermarket here. You don't like supermarkets, do you? I don't, I'm saying I dislike them. Go the, on, the, you the do. Wife, the you the wife and them. I shop in supermarkets. We do, we yeah. do. But I'm a little bit annoyed about the profit the supermarkets make. Why do the supermarkets in Britain have to work on a 75 to 8% profit? Well, in the rest of Europe, they work on 3 and to 3.5%. Three Why the difference? But who's the boss at the end of the day? The housewife is the, is the boss at the end of the day. She will determine what she buys, and she should. And she should see what's happening in the supermarkets and turn the package over and read the label and, and see where it comes from. Because it isn't labelled. It doesn't tell her where it comes from. It doesn't, doesn't tell her it comes from Wales. It doesn't tell her it comes from Botswana. It doesn't tell her it comes from Australia. Right. It's all hidden. Let's have the truth. Let's have it out. out. Label your meat. Let's say where, where, say where it comes from. And ask, are the welfare standards in these other countries as good as ours? Don't shoot the best farmers in the world down. Get the other farmers in the rest of the world to come up to our standard, and then you can have a chance of knocking us. But don't knock us. Supermarkets aren't the real reason for Reese's problems. And if we want him to stay on his farm and keep the valley looking like this, I'm coming to the conclusion we'll have to pay him a subsidy of some kind. If the government said, look, we're not going to give you production support, but we're going to give you income support, because we love you, and would you be we offended still, and insulted? I would not be offended, but we've still got to farm to a certain degree, Oliver. Of we course you'd have to farm. To farm. You'd have to farm because... You've it, got to have structure. The structure, Reese, would be that I wouldn't get that check, because I'm a big, fat, stupid barley baron, whereas you're a deeply sensitive, wonderful, glorious, and above all, responsible Welsh hill farmer. <laughs> That's structure for you. <laughs> That would be structured. I thought you'd agree with that description somehow. <laughs> you, you, must, you must give an incentive. Everybody needs an incentive in life. Oh, the incentive would be that you'd have to be a proper working farmer. You Absolutely. couldn't just sit in your house smoking cigars and, and waiting for that cheque to drop in your While the worst crisis in farming today is in the hills, some of the most militant farmers seem to come from a slightly flatter part of the country. If Oxford is the home of Lost Causes and Welling Garden City is the home of shredded wheat, then Anglesey must be the home of militant farmers, which is why I'm crossing the Menai Straits now to go and see possibly the most militant of all of them, Peter Rogers. So I'm a little sort of apprehensive to go and see Mr Rogers, because not only has he promised to talk to me and take me to the local cattle market, but worst of all, and most frightening of all, he's going to introduce me to some of his friends. It's a big market, you know, much bigger than I expected. That's the thing that I wanted to show you yeah. today, is, yeah. is why we've got the feeling here. Yeah. And you see that this, this market today, you can't, you can't park anything anywhere. Yeah. You know, and when you want to start to ruin the yeah. rural, rural areas, yeah. this is why the voice has been up here in the world. Your income depends on what happens in the next few minutes. Does that make you nervous? Well, I think I would be nervous if I were you. If I'm not happy, I will take them home. But, but what am I going to do with them when I get home? I've got a lot of sheep at home. Really? You can, have you put a reserve on them? No, I haven't, but it depends on, on how the bidding, bidding goes. All right, no, well, let's go and take a butcher's at your sheep, if you don't mind me using that expression. 
Peter's got two lots of lambs in the market today. He's feeling pessimistic because it's the worst year he's known in 25 years of farming. Prices are on the deck and getting worse each week. The market's collapsing for lots of reasons. Live exports to Europe have almost dried up. The strong pound has made our lambs expensive and, as if that weren't enough, the impoverished Russians no longer buy the sheepskins. I think we're quite a bit away. We're going to, no, no. So would you have to take it home again? Yeah, I'll take those home. Take these ones home? Yeah, yeah, and we sell these. 45 each for those. Yep. 38 yep. withdrawn for these. Yes, yes, yes. So we live in, we live in hope that the fat, the fat trade, you know, we can, we, we can always sell them fat in here. Yeah. So that's what you'll do, you just fatten them? Well, we, we, you know, we try, we try again. It's, right. You know, it's those troughs and roundabouts. Okay, thank you. Peter, to put it mildly, has never been a fan of mine. So where does this leave you as the politician, the leader of the uprising of Anglesey, the militants? I mean, what are you going to do now? Is it a new? I'm not going to back. I'm not going to back out now. I'm not going to back out now. I am with everybody else. I want people to have the same opportunities that I've had in this industry. And I feel very bitter. And I hope that your visit today has got home to you, Oliver, that you living in Cambridgeshire down there, that you have seen the, 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 the position, you've seen the, the strength of people that are in this auction today, what an important part it is of our everyday life in Anglesey. And I hope you will realise that we have got a case. We're not asking for subsidies. But the steel workers at Shotton, it is Shotton, isn't it? Just, just yeah, of course, it course it is, of course it is. They don't exist anymore, do they? No, no, they, they don't exist. Did any Anglesey farmer shed a tear for the steel workers of Shotton? If not, why should anybody shed a tear for the farmers of Anglesey or Cambridgeshire? Yeah, well, I, th I think that we've got a conscience like everybody else. I'm sure that we didn't, we, we had feelings, of course, when we lost the coal mines and of course when we lost the steel workers. But I'm trying to get over to you that we're losing an industry, which is going to be, what we're doing, in fact, is that, that, that as business people, we're losing our financial status, we're losing the, the, the stock values that we had before. Suddenly, the people that are going to go out of this industry are going to go out owing money or, in fact, with no, with no money. I think you, what you've got to face is that a lot of the steel workers, they, quite rightly, they had redundancies and they had money, they had training, they had training schemes to, to take them into other jobs. You explain to me the void that the countryside is going to be in when you bankrupt all these farmers and we're left with large acreages of land here which is, go which is going to go. You've travelled and seen some of the desolation in other countries when you lose that. The family farm has got to be maintained. You've got to have walls. You've got to have all these beautiful accesses, and we've got to maintain it. I, I, I know that subsidies are dirty words, but we've got to have fairness. Now, what are we now? We've got so much, 34.50. I do feel very sympathetic for Peter Rogers and all these Anglesey farmers here today because there's no doubt they are in serious, terrible trouble. But then so also are the pig farmers and the dairy farmers. And even, I hesitate to say, arable farmers like me have seen the price of wheat go from £110 two years ago to £60 today. The sodden and gloomy farmers of Anglesey somehow personify the crisis facing agriculture. Over the next five years, somewhere around 10,000 men like this will disappear. Some will become part-time, some will give up, and some will go bust. It's a process which has been happening for the last thousand years. It's sad, but inevitable. As I wander the country, preaching my gospel that farming shouldn't be treated differently from any other industry, I run into a lot of flack. 
Ah, say farmers, when coal miners lost their jobs, they received fat redundancy checks. And the same should happen to us. Rubbish. Farmers are self-employed businessmen with assets. When coal miners were forced to quit, all they had were their memories. In the good old days, which can be defined as that period that came between the Garden of Eden and Hampstead Garden suburb, most people ate food that was grown very locally. And then came modern transport and modern technology, and everything changed. But today, here on the Hlyn Peninsula in Wales, sticking out into the Irish Sea, farmers are just beginning to figure out that there may be alternatives to sheep, cows like that, and caravans. Yup. They're lettuces. Here in traditional sheep country, four farmers have gone in for some strange diversification. One of them is Geraint Jones, who gets my vote for farming courage. What did your neighbours, the other farmers around here, think when they saw you growing lettuce? That you were stark staring mad? At first, I think everybody was sort of sceptical and sort of maybe had a bit of a laugh. But I think they're all starting to realise that um, it's all come together. It's a simple idea. Grow local veg for local people, local schools, and local hotels. The man behind the idea is fruit and veg wholesaler Ian Silcock. And in the last three months, oh. he's flogged 3,000 quid's be... worth of summer crops right. from Geraint and his mates. Right. Well, let's go and look at your lettuces then. Yes. Um, you've got two varieties of Lollaroso here. Can I touch it? Yeah, by all means. Come on. That's what it's there for. All right. So this is, looks sort of like a bloodstained sponge. Who do you sell this to? We sell this to the hotels. A little gritty, but no other one. Well, it will be. It's only just been picked out of the oh, field. Lovely. Now, it's less red. That's slightly less red. Yeah. Well, that's Lola Beander. That's the green variety. I'm not saying that I'm coming up with the answer, but what I'm hoping to do is to come up with a possible alternative that is going to enable them to maybe get some of their income back. And you never know where it goes from here. You can smell the freshness in that, can't you? Nice, two venison, one tuna, three fish, two goose, one lamb. Peter Jackson looks like a rally driver, but actually he's a chef at a fancy hotel which gets its veg from Ian Silcock. Do you use mostly Welsh food here? 95% of the produce we use is Welsh. Why? Because as a chef, I have got to cook things that people can't do at home. And with supermarkets making things more available to the customer, it's getting harder and harder for the chef to produce things you can't do at home. So one of the major things you can do is taste. And to have things that are just picked that day, you can be at a supermarket any day because their produce is going to be at the minimum five days old if not older, and the flavour's gone. And the accountability, the food's safe, I know where it's coming from. Ah, oh, wow. This is a double treat for you. First of all, I'm serving it for you. Yes. And second, this is the warm scallop salad with a carrot and fennel dressing. And in Welsh, you say, win high, which is enjoy. Thank you. And as if that's not enough, I've got the Hlyn Peninsula off there, Snowden over my right shoulder, sunshine and a clean napkin and i don't normally eat meat and fish together but still here goes one scallop in a mm. wow and i better have some lamb salt marsh lamb mm. crispy delicious but most interesting of all is the lettuce because this will have come from geraint's farm mm. I'm all for good food, but I've got to admit that replacing lambs with lettuces isn't the solution to farming's problems today. No, the answer will have to be a bit more radical. I personally don't like agricultural subsidies, but I have to admit that without them, the uplands of Britain, Bodmin Moor, North Wales and here in the Highlands would all go bankrupt. The farmers would disappear, the countryside would revert to scrub, it would be a disaster both socially and environmentally. So what's the answer? The answer is that farmers in the uplands must be given money, but not simply to produce more, as was the old system. 
Instead, I reckon they should be sent a check through the letterbox every month from Brussels saying, please stay on your farms. This check should enable you to survive in the open market without any production subsidies at all. I hope it'll work, and I think it'll work. And the effect will be felt by more than just farmers. Here in John Cameron's Glen, a so-called less favored area, everything depends on agriculture. So what's his solution? I have no quarrel with her. I think we should broaden the basis of supporting the less favoured areas. I think we should take into effect the amount of labour, the amount of people, full-time permanent people living up the Glen. That's very important. That should be part of the criteria. The environment, the protection of the environment, provided it's a balanced, a balanced objective, that should be part of the criteria. Welfare should be part of it. We're all looking after our stock, certainly in this part of the world, you know, up to the welfare codes anyway. But that should all be part of the criteria. Where I have to take issue with you, I'm not prepared to sit in my backside and do nothing with my land and get paid and get, get paid that way. You know, God gave us good natural resources and we should be making the best use of them as we can. And remember, the, the type of produce that's coming from these hills is still wanted, is still wanted. So, you know, forget about that part of your, of your theory, but I go along with, 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 with a lot of it. But I keep coming back to the same conclusion, that if we must have subsidies, they should go to small farmers. If I were the chap standing in Brussels, sitting in Brussels, behind his enormous desk with a computer on the desk, I'd say to myself, the person I want to encourage in the Scottish Highlands is not the John Camerons, it's the smaller man, because I want to see Scotland and Bavaria and Portugal and Greece populated by small farmers that keep the rural infrastructure going. And therefore, I will gear my subsidies to support him and to hell with John John Cameron, to hell with Oliver Walston. They'll look after themselves. Oliver, you're a bit with respect. You're a bit out of touch with what Brussels are saying. Now, that's, what, I'm saying what, that's what I would say if I were in Brussels. Well, thank goodness you're not in Brussels. <laughs> because what, what they are concerned with in Brussels, and becoming more concerned, and I'm delighted that, 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 that the emphasis on this, is, is to maintain the rural population. You know, there's a, there's a lot of talk about in the environmentalist uh, camp about endangered species. Species. Well, in my view, the most endangered species in the less favoured areas throughout, not just Scotland, but Europe, at the present moment, are the people who work there. And I believe we are getting that message through. We need to keep people out these glens, and that's what I'm all about. For once, I agree with John Cameron completely. Without farming, the highlands would lose their magic, and the countryside itself would die. It must never be allowed to happen. Next week, in the last programme of the series, I'll be looking into the future. What will farming be like in 10 or 15 years' time?